there we go. And um, and let's do some review. So I'm prepared for this. So the first chapter that we did this quarter was on leading tone seventh chords. So first of all, let me ask what a leading tone chord is. What's, what do we mean by a leading tone chord? And um, I'm going to have Daviel answer first and Leslie answer second, since Daviel got here first. So Daviel, what is a leading tone chord? A chord that's built on the seventh step of the scale. You are 90% there. That is true in major. But in minor, it's not necessarily true. Leslie, what? add some detail to that. So the leading tone chord is built on the seventh degree of the scale. But what makes it a leading tone chord? What are we missing in that definition? Mm, I don't remember. <laughs> All right. So a leading tone is a half step away from the tonic. So it's, uh, let me see if I get, if I share some sound, if it'll actually share. Hold on a second. It sounds like this. Um, you know, uh, it sounds like this. Share. Come on, you. Half step away. So in major, the seventh degree is a leading tone. It's a half step away. In natural minor, it's not. That's not. That's the leading tone. This is a whole step away. So a leading tone chord is a se built on seven, that's correct, but it has to be the half step away from the tonic to be a leading tone chord, otherwise it's just a seven chord. So in minor, we have to use either the harmonic or the melodic minor, we have to raise the seventh. So there's always an accidental on the root to form a, a leading tone chord. Does that make sense or do you want me to show that to you on finale? I'll that makes you. sense. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Well, these are the things we forget, but then on the exam, it costs you lots of points. So I'll, and so I'll just quickly demonstrate. I'm in C minor. Um, and if I did seven to one, it would look like this, right? But seven, there's a major chord whole step away. So we always raise that degree and that gives us a leading tone chord. That's just putting it in harmonic minor. While we're here, let me review a confusion with numbers. So numbers. So this, if I use Roman numerals, seven, whoops, it's supposed to be small letters, seven to one, right? Um, minor one. Roman numerals tell us what degree of the scale a chord is based on. So a leading tone chord is a seventh chord, a seven chord, because it's Roman numeral seven, seventh degree of the scale. So one set of numbers tells us what degree the scale. Now, if I add a note in this, that's a seventh over the root. So this is now a seventh chord. We show that by putting, ah, sorry guys. We show that by putting in that next to our chord, we put a seven. But this is an Arabic numeral seven. So the Arabic numeral seven means that there's a note that's a seventh above the root. The Roman numeral seven means that we're building the chord on the seventh degree of the scale. And so we call this a seven, seven chord, but the first seven is a Roman numeral. And the second seven is an Arabic numeral. You can't tell that when we say it, but it means seven, meaning it's built on the seventh degree of the scale, seventh chord, meaning it's got a note that's a seventh above the root. Are we clear about that, everyone? Yeah, um, I, I know you guys are clear, but I've had so many students get confused if I say a five of five, seven of, you know, those words, when we speak them, they're so confusing. When we see them, we can sort of understand them. Um, so anyway, so the chapter we're dealing with are leading tone chords. That's chords built on the seventh, a half step away from tonic, but they have a seventh added. Yes, Leslie. All right, on the test, are we going to be um, tested on pop notation because I um, think I still confuse pop notation. Okay, so let's talk about pop notation and and uh, what we also call um, what do we call it? Um, uh, ma uh, macro notation. Okay, so let's take a look at the same thing. And I'll make this. Yeah. So if I this is I have to first of all tell you what key this is in because 
seven doesn't mean anything if we don't know what key. So in regular notation, we give the key with a colon, and then we use Roman numerals. In what they call macro notation, we just say what the chord is. So this is a B diminished seven chord. And that circle, it's actually a half diminished, but um, so we put a slash through the circle. And I'm gonna put a slash after the circle because I can't remember what keystroke gives me the slash with the circle. But B zero, and that's what we would call macro notation to a C minor. And that's how you notate it. In pop notation, we would just call this B diminished and then the seven with no slash. Whoops, you can't see that. Because pop notation, the seven always means minor seventh. In fact, that's a diminished seventh. So I'd have to change that. Hold on a second. Come on, you. Let me make you bigger. Really? There you go. Okay. Um, so in pop notation, well, that chord's hard to write in pop notation. One way to do is B diminished, uh, B diminished chord with a diminished seven. Um, so I'll, I'll explain, but anyway, I, you won't do these chords. I'll, I'm gonna do a unit on that before we're done. Let's not do it now because it'll confuse what we're doing. And if I put it in there, it'll be simple stuff, okay? But I will go over it before the exam and do a review of it. Okay, Leslie? Okay, sounds good. You really good. want me to do it? I'll, I'll do some of it now. Why not go to the whiteboard? You ask now. Who am I <laughs> it's okay. Thank well, you. I, I don't want to forget, and it's a really good question. So let's, let's just put some pop symbols up here, okay? So in pop notation, um, you normally just use the name of the chord. So C is a C chord. Capital means major. And small means minor. So a C major chord is just a capital C. A C minor chord is just a small C. And then a small C with a little circle, that's diminished. And if we do augmented, a C with a plus sign, capital C with a plus sign is augmented. We haven't done a lot with augmented chords, but they do exist. So that's your basic chord thing. Capital just means major, small means minor, circle with a small means diminished, and plus means augmented. Now, if I add a seventh, seven always means minor seven. So for example, if I have a C seven, that's a C E G, because it's a major chord with a B flat, a minor seven. So it's what we would call a dominant seventh chord. Doesn't matter what the key signature is. If I want to have a chord with a major seven, then I write MAJ seven, that equals major seventh. Okay, so that would be like C major seven. That would be a C major chord with a major seven. So a minor minor chord is just a small C with a seven. The seven is always a minor seven. So even if you have a half diminished chord, a C diminished with a seven, is actually just a half diminished chord in pop notation. That's a minor seventh with a C diminished chord. And what makes it confusing if you do full diminished, they there's so many different notations, but the things like C minor flat five flat seven. I mean, it's just weird, but you could you probably could do it like this um, with a flat seven, something like that. So C diminished with a flat seven. So it takes a seventh lower than half a step. So that's your basic pop notation. And then finally, if you want to do inversions, if I have a first inversion, I don't write a six in there. I write C over the bass note. C over E is first inversion. C over G would be second inversion. That's pretty much pop notation. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So go ahead and ask as many questions as you want. I think I was okay. I think I was just confused. Like if I look up chord sheets, I get confused with the um there's some where they notate it with like a, like you were saying a flat five or and I was like, what's a five? <laughs> yeah, so when I do a C flat a C minor, right? C minor is C, E flat, and G, right? And then I put in there flat five. So let's put the flat five. Um, I could do it with a flat side. Let's say I do flat five. What I'm saying is you take the five over the base, that's the G, and you flat it. So C, E flat, G flat is a diminished chord. But a lot of pop notation, they use the C minor flat five to mean diminished. 
Flat five means you flat the five as well as the third. So that's, that just means diminished chord. It's another way of noting there's different systems. There's one system that writes the diminished chord that way, and there's one system that writes it with the little circle. Okay. And do you understand why that would be a diminished chord? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, yeah I'll that you, makes sense. I'll show you on finale just to make sure we all see it because this stuff can be really confusing and I don't want you like being in a pop band and not being able to read a chord sheet and then having someone make fun of you or something because that's really so here's a C minor chord and you can see it's I've got a key signature that gives me an E flat that's C minor if I want to make that thing diminished I have to make this perfect fifth a diminished fifth so I have to flat the G so that's all I do now it's a now it's a diminished chord so that's a C minor chord with the fifth flatted so it's a C minor flat five and that's one pop way of doing diminished chords. Very annoying. It's a good topic for review guys. So ask me more questions. And what about for, I think I've asked you this before, but I forgot um, if it's like G, like let's say it's a G chord and then sustain and then it's S U. S, which I'm guessing is sustain, and then four. Yeah, it's usually suspend or sustain. So let's see what that is. Here's a G chord. I'll do G major, which is going to be weird in this key. There's my G major chord. So this is the root, right? The G. The B is the third over the root. You can count as three notes, right? G, A, B. And the D is a five over. G, A, B, C, D. So what would a fourth over the G be? Can you, can you ask that again? You're kind of cutting out. Okay, so if you're counting these, G is the root, right? So B is a third over the root because it's G, A, B. It's three notes, gives you the B. The D is the fifth over because it's G, A, B, C, D, five. What would a fourth be over a G? Would it be the C? Yeah, so if I add a C to this chord, which is not uncommon in music, actually, and particularly pop music, but we do it in classical music, too. In pop notation, that is a G chord with a sus4. And I think sus actually means suspend instead of sustain, but I don't know what it means. It's, we always call it sus4, but I think it means it's a suspended four. So that chord is, is, would be written. Let me write it here for you. So this is what you were talking about. This would be G because it's G major, sus4, because the fourth is also in there. Sometimes it's written as G add four. And why some people do add, like if you add, if you do the second, it's often add two, but the four is often sus four. I don't know how many people make the distinction, but at some point books would just do G four, maybe it's a G major with a four added, but it's best to do G sus four. That means you have a G major chord and then you sustain a suspended of onto that a four. So you got the four as well as the chord. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. If things don't make sense, please do ask me. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I, you know, sometimes I'm lousy at explaining things, but I'm happy to try lots of ways until no, things. That makes sense. Okay. And I'm not going to ask anything very tough about it. I just want to make sure that we're familiar with it because unlike the rest of music theory, which I think is very valuable, this is critical. You're going to run into this. And it's not hard to learn on your own, but if you don't have a, a hint, you can go there and be very confused. When you look at these chord sheets and say, what? So we're going to try not to confuse you. Okay, so there's our pop notation. And remember, in pop notation, we do talk, there's also macro notation, which is just the chord name without the inversion. So, you know, we just, we use just chord names that just allows us to see how roots move. So, but I don't really care very much about macro notation. I care about Roman numerals. I care about pop. So let's go back to where we were. We have these leading tone chords the sharp seven the seven right below the leading the uh, tonic and then we add sevenths to them because we can now first of all daviel you get to answer this question how does this, a leading tone chord function where does it want to go what do we call its function uh, as a dominant i think like it it's a one. dominant function it wants to go to one Okay. We call it dominant function. It functions exactly the same way the five chord functions. In fact, it shares a lot of notes with the five chord. So it wants to go to one. So anytime you have a leading tone chord or leading tone seven chord, it wants to go to one. 
That's its function. And we could add a seventh to any chord, but it's very powerful. We do it to any chord with a dominant function. So Leslie, I add a seventh to a chord. How does it want to resolve? It wants to resolve half a step. Not necessarily half a step, just downward by step. Downward by step. Downward by step. So the seventh is just going to go down to whatever note it can go to. Usually downward by step. Could be a half step, could be a whole step. But the seventh is going to want to go down. Sevenths of all chords. Anytime you add a seventh to a chord, what it wants to do is go downward by step. Can't always do it, but it's one of those rules that's best done if it can be done. It's much smoother. So sevenths go downward by step. So Daviel, the root of this chord is a leading tone. It's so how does the root want to go? Uh upward by a step. Yeah. Well, it's usually a half step. Yeah, well, lead tones are half step, so it's going to want to go upward by half step. And if it's in either the root or the top, it sort of has to do that. You know, you get Bach and he violates that rule all the time. So if it's in an inner part, we sometimes violate it to get complete things, but that fit that lead tone wants to go up, the seventh wants to go down. In fact, if I if we do those chords, you'll see that the leading tone and the fifth form a tritone because that's what makes it diminished. They'll want to go in opposite directions. And then the other two voices, if they form a tritone, it's fully diminished. They'll want to go in opposite directions too, with the seventh down and the third up. So the way, but most of that happens automatically. You don't have to think about it. But if you have your leading tone go up and your seventh go down, your voice leading will be pretty good. So let's do some practicing. We're going to start with one chord at a time. C major. Look at it. So I, I hope you can see my finale, right? There's C major. All I want you guys to do is write for me a leading tone seventh chord and put it in a way that will resolve to this chord just like that. So figure out the notes are, give me a thumbs up when you've got it, then I'll give you the correct answer. And you can look and see if you've got it right. We're not doing four parts here, but it's the same if it was in four parts. I can show you that. One done. Two done. Okay, so here's the correct answer. And the way I did this, and then I'm going to show you how this would work in four parts too, is that I know the leading tone in C has got to be a B. If C is eight, B is seven. That's the leading tone. We're in major, so we don't need any accidentals at all. So I just built a chord, a third, a fifth, and a seventh. The seven goes downward by step. Now I'm checking the voice leading and the leading tone goes up by step, goes up by half step in this case, I can expect. So I know my voice leading's good. So that's all you have to do. It's pretty straight ahead. Now, if I want to do this in four parts, um, I would probably do something like this. Um, B to a C in the bass, that would take the B out of here. Then the tenor would have to be up close spacing. So I would probably use the D just like it is here. And um, the D will probably want to go, hmm, it really wants to go up to the E, but it doesn't matter, put on the C. And then these other voices you can see will just go down. And that way my lead, my tritone is going in opposite directions. Everything was fine. So it's not, if you're doing it in four part, it's not really different. I just dropped the bass by an octave. So before we do the next chord, let me ask you something. Can the, whose turn is it to ask a question? I'll ask Davia, I think it's her turn. Can, can the leading tone chord be in inversion? Yes or no, Davio? Yes. Yes, it can be. And of course, the leading tone, if it's in inversion, may change the inversion of the tonic. Leslie, in fact, is it more common in root position or more common in inversion? Mm, 
You got a 50-50 chance. Take a guess. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> it sounds like it, it makes sense if they're a root position, but. See, it makes sense it's root position, but composers do not like diminished chords in root position. I don't know why. So more than half the time it's an inversion, usually first inversion, but I don't know why that would be. You know, it seems so obvious that you want to drive to the tonic, right? I would think root position would be standard, but it turns out that in the history of music, it's more common in inversion than it is in root position. That Maybe may be because a question. it's like more predictable. I, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> All I know is that if there is a question on an exam, it's only worth a point or two. So, but if you can remember that inversion is more common, it's a possibility that question appears on an exam. I haven't made up the exam yet. It seems a little fussy, but the book makes a point of it. So I just give it to you in case I put on the exam, I won't feel guilty. It won't be worth a lot anyway. So that's all there is to doing one in major. Let's just go into a different key to prove we can. Again, four part or in this three part treble clef isn't any different really. We just would take the bass down an octave. So now we're in A major. Give me a, write down the leading tone seventh chord and um, Give me a thumbs up and then I'll give you the chord and you tell me if you got it right or not. One thumbs up. And there's two. So it's the same process, guys. If A is tonic, A is eight, seven is the G sharp. We're in major, A major. So I don't have to have any accidentals. So I know there's the chord. And look at that. The leading tone is the root. It goes up and the seventh goes down. So it works. If I put this in inversion somehow, I could still have the B go down to tonic. Um, the only thing is that, I, for example, if I put the G on top, it would just change a little bit of how to resolve. So if the G is on top, it would have to go up to the A. We'd have to do that to make it work. So we could do it in, in inversion. Let's just quickly, while we're talking about inversions, review the notation. So. If you look at these intervals over the bass note, the bottom is always the bass, regardless what clef I'm in. That's a third over the bass, that's a fifth, and that's a sixth over the bass. So that would be called a B, a B six five chord. Six five means first inversion for seventh. If it's in root position like this one, oh, that's not a B chord. I'm sorry, it's a G sharp. I lied to you. Sorry. I should not lie to you. G sharp, six five chord. If I'm in root position, then it's just B7, right? Because that's just root position. I need a little diminished sign there. I left it up. But G sharp is the chord, but it's telling you it's in first inversion. Second inversion is 4 3. Last inversion is 4 2. And you can always figure that out by just counting the intervals. That's a 5 and a 6, right? So you want to know those things the 4 2, the 4 3, the 6 5, and the 7. Okay. Any questions on that? Did you all get this one right? Give me a thumbs up if you got it right. Okay, good. So I'm going to skip the next major one. This is E flat major. I did that so we work in both sharps and flats, but there are no accidentals. So let's skip that. Let's go to minor. Here we're in A minor. So now we have to do the same thing. We just have to build a seven chord. But in building that seven chord, we have to make sure it's a leading tone chord. So give me a thumbs up when you've written it down, and then I will put it in there.
One done. Two done. Okay, so now what we did before is really the right thing. The only thing is if A is seven, in natural minor G, if A is eight, G is seven, but that's a whole step. So we have to remember to sharp the bass. And that can be this chord. And that's all there's to it. This, now we have a leading tone because we sharp the root. Leading tone goes up, seven goes down. It's no different from major. It is different in one way. If we look at this chord here, in major, B to A is a minor seventh. So this is a diminished minor chord. The, whenever we do two words like that, the first chord talks about the chord itself. The second word talks about the seventh. So it's a diminished chord with a minor seventh. That's a diminished minor chord. So all major seven, seven chords are diminished minor or what we call half diminished. That's about the little circle with the slash to it. When we're in minor, that's a diminished seventh. A G natural to an F is a minor seventh. We shrink it by raising the bottom up. So it's smaller than a minor seventh. It's a diminished seventh. So that's a diminished diminished chord or what we call full diminished. And that's a little circle with no slash through it. So in minor, our seven seven chord is fully diminished. In major, our seven seven chord is half diminished. Otherwise, it's the same thing. We could put it in inversion if we want. The leading tone wants to go up. The seventh wants to go down. It's pretty straight ahead. So did everyone get that? Give me a thumbs up if you got it. Good. We're going to practice one more. I could do two more, but I just want to practice one more. We'll probably, yeah, we better do two more. So here's F sharp minor. Again, the key signature looks like A major, but it's the relative minor. It's F sharp minor. Throw me in a 7-7 a seven, seven chord here, a leading tone 7th chord. And I'm going to stop the share so I can get the accidentals right. I'm going to put mine in because the computer's going to give me trouble. Uh, let's see. Is that, is that chord? Oh, I think it's going to be trouble. Don't look, the answer's on the screen. Wait till you finish, then take a look. Okay, Leslie's done. There we go. So here's our correct answer. And you notice that, so for pianists, they hate to write E sharp. They think E sharp is the same as F natural. But it really isn't. It's a leading tone. That sharp tells you that note's driving up to the F sharp. So we write as an E sharp. We take the seventh. That's eight, seven, sharp it. Now, does anyone have a question? Did I hear a question about to be asked? No? If I want to put this in inversion like I did the last time, I could do that. Um, if I have it in inversion, then you can see that leading tone's going to want to go up. So leading tone goes up, seventh goes down. We can still write it in inversion and get to a tonic and root position. So that still works. But E sharp going up to the F sharp. And it's a little tricky because people who know the keyboard well do not like writing E sharps and B sharps, but they're real notes. Let's do one last one. Let's go to the key of C minor and see if we could do that one. All right, C minor. Give me a thumbs up when you got it. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Now I'm going to quickly do this in four part harmony so that you can see what it would be like if you do four part harmony. Because, whoops, because we know that in E flat chord, right? If E flat is, if E flat is um, eight, then D double, uh, sorry, if E flat is eight, then D is seven. So, is that, did I say that right? C is the chord, sorry, I lied to you. B is seven. So here would be the correct chord, but I want to show it to you. So we have to remember to, to 
flatting, a sh- a sh- naturally a flat is the same as sharpening a note. That was my point. But if I wanted to do this thing in four-part harmony to show you how it works, so in case I, in the exam it says four-part harmony, it would look like this. Um, let me see. It would look something like this. Um, and then take it out of here. So it's really nothing different. I just have to move some notes around. And you notice what I did here, the D is within an octave of the soprano. So I tried to do close spacing, drop the bass down here. Leading tone goes up, seventh goes down, nothing has changed. And the only trick here is to know that a natural on a flat is the same as a sharp on a natural. That's still sharpening the note. You still raised it half a step. Is there anything confusing here? Does anyone have any questions? Do we get all this right? Give me some thumbs up if you're good. Okay, so if we're good, so the good news is in exactly 31 minutes, we conquered an entire chapter. We've done six chapters this quarter. We just did an entire chapter, you understand it, plus we did some notation stuff on pop notation, which is in a different chapter. So that's a pretty good start. Let's go on to the next chapter and see if we can move as well through that. But I just show you that you know the stuff really well and the exam is not going to get you. The next chapter is even easier. It's non-dominant seventh chords. So let's remember the dominant chords are the true dominant, the five chord, what we call the dominant, and the leading tone chord, the seven chord. Those are the two that function like dominants. And we put sevenths on them and the seventh goes down and it takes us to tonic and life is beautiful and birdies sing and Walt Disney movies happen. Really nice. But every chord can have a seventh added to it. Every chord can. And they just, they don't change their function. A two chord still wants to go to a five. A six still wants to go to a two. A three still wants to go to a six. Nothing changes except you get this extra color of the seventh. That's all. So the basic thing is no worries. But let's ask a question. I think it's Leslie's turn. In every chord that's not a dominant chord, if I put a seventh on it, how does that seventh want to resolve? I think it still wants to revolve downwards. It sure does, downward by step. It can't always, and sometimes it takes a a chord or two to get there, but basically that's what it wants to do. So if a two chord, let's go into E flat major, because I've got a key signature up here. If I've got a two chord in E flat, that's an F minor chord, and I put a seventh on it, uh, like this. Now a two chord wants to go to a five chord, so it wants to go to a B flat chord. So there it is. Um, I'll put it right there. And you notice that the seventh, the top note of the chord, went down by step. That's just the way sevenths work. It doesn't matter. So 99% of the chapter was just covered right there. You can add a seventh to any chord, and the seventh is going to try to resolve downward by step. Can't always, but mostly it can. And they can follow each other. This, this went to a five chord. Well, that five chord, which is a B flat chord, could also be a B flat seven chord. I mean... I could have made this, wait a second. You know, seventh chord can go to a seventh chord, can go to a seventh chord, it doesn't matter. Put the seventh in there. And then that can go to a C7, uh, to an E flat seven, why not? Um, it's a little tricky if I go to an E flat seven, but that's okay. Um, so I'll, I won't do it because the seventh has to go down. Yeah, it would do it. Let's do it. There we go. So you can see the seventh here goes down by step. The seventh here, which is uh, what key are we? Um, this is the B flat, but the A flat goes down by step. Now we're on a one seven chord. I can put a seventh on anything. And listen to how pretty that sounds. Seventh chords are pretty. Okay, um, here we go. Seventh chords are pretty. And you can just hear that fall of the sevenths coming down. Really beautiful. So that's most of the chapter. The only thing we want to know now is what kind of chords are in are in the keys. So if I go to C, uh, let's go C major, because it's easier to see it. And you know this already, but this is something you have to memorize because you have to memorize it. Um, so I'll just remind you, if I put seven chords, whoops, that was weird. Oh, get away, thank you. 
if I'm in major, the one chord is what? Tell me if it's a major minor or major major or ma or minor minor, whatever chord it is. Daviel first. What's the one chord? Major major. Yes, Leslie. What's the two chord? Minor minor. Yes, and so let me give you the rule. Now we've got it started. There are three minor chords. Remember the two, three, and six. All of them take minor sevenths. All the minor chords take minor sevenths. The dominant chord is the major minor chord. That's your five chord. And that's your only dominant chord. The other major chords take major sevenths. So this is a major minor. The other major chords, which is one and four, they take major major. And then in minor and major chords, your, your diminished is a half diminished. It's a diminished with a minor. So if I were going to run through this, it's major major, minor minor. Minor, minor, major, 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 minor. That's the only one that's different. Then minor, minor, diminished minor, and then major, major. And we just want to remember them, but the easy way to remember is we know one, four, five are our three majors. Therefore, two, four, six are our minor, sevens are diminished. So if you remember that sevens are diminished and that the three, the three famous chords, tonic, subdominant, dominant, or major, all the rest are minor. So you don't have to memorize everything. You can memorize by that. Then all the minor ones take minor sevenths. The dominant chord takes a minor seventh. Everything else takes a major seventh except the um, diminished chord, half diminished chord. So that's the way to, rem to memorize it. And that may or may not appear on the exam, but that's a good thing to have memorized. Now, if we go into minor, it's a little more complicated. I won't make you memorize it because you can easily figure it out. Um, let's go to C minor and hold notes on their original pitches. Okay. Oops. Didn't want to do that. Let's do it one more time. Let's go to minor. Hold the original st same staff lines. There we go. So if I go into minor, remember that I use melodic, uh, harmonic minor usually. So what that does is that the two chords that are changed are those. So my five chord is still a major minor chord. Dominant chords are always major minor. My seven chord is full diminished instead of half because the top note's flatted now, but it's still a natural there. Otherwise, everything just shifts over by two. So my tonic chord, my it, you know, it's, this is my what would have been my one in E flat major. It's now my three chord. So three is major, and then six is major because that was you know it just shifts everything over by by two. So we can still figure out it's minor, 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 major, major, minor, minor, major, minor, major, major. And then because that, I'll put that so you can see that then they get a full diminished and we're done. So it just shift everything over because we just went, what was one is now three. So everything is shifted over by two. And then we just alter the five and the seven. Does that make sense? Did that confuse you? Leslie says it's good. Davia, how are you doing? Good. Okay. That's the entire chapter, guys. I don't know. I think that they put this chapter in here because after sec, um, after dominant chords and set things, there was so much to learn. They put a, a chapter that's pretty simple. And basically, sevens go downward by step. Some are major, major. Some are major, minor. Just have to know a couple of important ones. And that's it. Whole chapter's done. That took us seven minutes. I'm not saying you shouldn't review it for the exam. I'm just saying that you don't have to be nervous about it. That's something you can do in your sleep. And I don't think that I have any questions that are surprises about that. And so then that brings us to the first chapter that sounds confusing, and that's the secondary dominant chapter. Now, give me just a sense by a thumbs up if you feel pretty confident with secondary dominance. I'm going to start reviewing them anyway but I want to know if I have to go slowly or if I go quickly. If you feel confident, give me a thumbs up. I got one thumbs up, but I think only one. Yeah, this, okay, I'm going to go slowly. And Davio, I know you've got it down because you had your thumbs up, but be patient with us. Maybe you'll just, you'll see something for it. It's, this is just slightly difficult concept. So the idea is that sometimes I have a progression. Let me, go back to C major again and write a progression up here. Um, and, and you know how progressions work, right? They're 
that we have that chart. So we know that certain chords like to go to certain chords. So I'm going to do the most basic progression there is a one chord to say a three chord. Um, I won't, I'm not going to worry about parallel points, guys. So I'm just going to put it in root position to the six, to the two, to the five, to the one. And you notice that each of these happens to be a circle progression. And Davio, do you want to tell us what a circle progression is? Going up by a fourth. By a fourth. As, exactly. It's when the root goes up by a fourth or down by a fifth. And make sure you say the root because some people think bass note. For example, if I put this three chord in inversion, let me just put it in inversion for you. It, the bass only goes up by step, but the root still goes up by a fourth or down by a fifth. So this is still a circle progression. And that's why when we do macro analysis, we don't worry about the inversions. A macro analysis, we just give the names of the chords. So if I was doing a macro, that's how I find the circle progressions. Let's show this to you quickly. A macro analysis, in, it's a C chord. I don't even have to say what key it doesn't matter. To an E minor, whoops, E minor, to an A minor, to a D minor, to a G major, to a C major. And you can see right there that E to A is up a fourth, A to D is up a fourth. These are just the roots. It doesn't matter. We don't put any inversions in. So we know we have a circle progression. I'm going to put this guy back where he was to make it easy to see. So the thing about circle progression is that 5-1 is a circle progression. G to C, 5 to 1 is a circle progression. So anytime I have a circle progression, I can strengthen it by making it sound like it's a five going to a one, just temporarily. I can make that D chord sound like it's a five and G is a one. So when we do that, and it's just temporary, we're not modulating, we're just making this stronger. So what we're saying is I'm gonna take this G chord, which in the key of C is a five chord, but I'm gonna make it sound for the briefest, tiniest nanosecond, like it's a tonic, like it's a one chord, because I'm gonna proceed it by its own dominant. And we call the process of making something sound like tonic over a very short amount of time. Leslie, what do we call that process? Can you say that again? If I take a chord and I make it a, sound like it's tonic for a very, very short amount of time, I just make it appear because I, I have a, its own dominant in front of it. We have a name for that. We make something sound like tonic very shortly. We're not modulating, we're not changing keys. We're just for a moment making it seem like tonic. Mm, I remember the concept, but I don't remember the name. I know, but you should remember the name because it's the most fun name to say in all of music. It's the silly name. It's tonicization. Oh, we tonic the chord. So you take a tonic and we tonicize it. We make it appear to be a tonic, and that's called tonicization. Tonic. You know, musicians are nuts. You don't have to invent stupid words like that. Tonicization, but it's a great word. It's a word you can say at a party and people will laugh. It's a great word. So one should learn that word, not for music class, for life. It's a great word. So how do I make this sound like tonic? I have to make this chord sound like dominant. And to do that, dominant chords are always, are they major or are they minor? Davio, your turn. Can you ask the question again? Yeah, are dominant chords always major or are they always minor or can they be either one? Dominant chords? Yeah. Well, the dominant chord built on the five is always major, but the dominant chord built on the seven is always diminished. Ah, right. So you're using dominant in the sense of function. And I was just meaning the five chord, but that's exactly right. So, you know, we use dominant two ways. One is to mean the five chord and one to mean the five and the seven chord. And it's the same word. And, um, and so, I, and so, so you were correct. So the dominant built on the five is always a major chord. So D minor is minor. So a two to a five is a minor chord to a major chord. Two to five always is. So all I have to do is sharp the... Um, the, three, thir the third of this chord turned into a major chord, and now there's no longer two chord. It sounds like it's a five chord in the key of G. G's been temporarily turned into tonic. It's been tonicized just for a moment. So the way we would notate this is something like this. We'd say the key of C, so I have to put the colon there, and I'm going to come over here. We know that the G is a five chord, and the C is a one chord. But the D, which used to be a two chord when it was, you know, when it was minor, has been changed. The D is now a five of five. It's now a 
functions like the dominant of my five chord. So the bottom under the slash tells you what chord is being affected. And the top tells you it's acting like a five in that key. So this chord has been tonicized. It's now acting briefly as one. And this chord is acting like the five chord of that chord. So it's a five of five, which then goes to a five to a one. Is that clear for everybody? Okay, now let's pretend we didn't want to emphasize the five chord. It's strong enough as it is. Let's say we want to emphasize the two chord. Well, we can do that too, right? That's easy enough. Um, so I, I'll change the notation in a minute. Well, I'd better change it now or I'll confuse everybody, including me. Um, so let's change this now back to a two chord. So how do I tonicize the D? Well, I can tonicize the D also, just like it's D minor. All I need to do is go to the circle progression, the note that's the fifth of it, and make it major. I've got an A minor. I turn it to major. That's all. I do exactly the same thing. If I make that a major chord, now instead of sounding like a six chord, because six chords are minor, it sounds like it's a five chord in the key of D minor. I've tonicized the D minor. So now it's the same kind of notation. I put a five here, meaning I'm doing a note that sounds, let's get some room, like doing a note that sounds like a dominant, but not a five of the two. So I put a slash, I put the two underneath. This chord is now a five of my two chord, and two has been tonicized. For a very brief moment, it sounds like the tonic. This is like five going to D minor. Then as soon as we hit that, we realize, no, that's a two chord going to five to a one. Is that clear? Okay, so I'm going to pick it up from here. There's lots more to be said about secondary dominance, and then we'll do secondary leading tones. But we're halfway there. So what we'll do on after the long weekend is we'll review secondary dominance and secondary leading tones, and then the last day we'll, we'll spend on form and reviewing any questions you have. But once we get through this, you'll have reviewed all the main topics and be in great shape for the final, guys. Um, and so you have a long weekend coming up. Just get lots of rest. You're going to need it for the stretch. Take advantage of it. Be safe, everybody. The roads are going to be crowded. You know what I mean? And um, I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday, and I hope you have a lovely, lovely weekend. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great one.